The Real Saint Nick. At Christmas, children wait for Saint Nicholas to bring gifts down the chimney. But it's not just a story. Saint Nicholas was a real person. A long time ago, a man named Marcus occupied a house with his family. He was not modest. He always told everybody he was the strongest man in the province. He worked hard, but he could barely sustain his family. He wanted to save money and prosper. Still, he could never earn a penny more than he needed. One day, Marcus made an agreement with a blacksmith. The blacksmith had a lot of work to do, but he couldn't do it all by himself. Marcus wanted to help him forge iron. The blacksmith agreed to compensate him with a lot of money. In the same town, there was a man named Nicholas. At an early age, Nicholas started preaching, but he also believed that he should be humble and charitable. He learned that helping people gave him even more satisfaction than preaching. One day, Nicholas encountered Marcus. Marcus told Nicholas about his agreement with the blacksmith. "I worked hard for him," Marcus said. But a problem arose. Even though I worked for him, he didn't pay me. Nicholas wanted to help Marcus. That night, he went back to Marcus's house. He brought a bag of gold. It exceeded the amount that Marcus needed. Nicholas climbed up a ladder. And dropped the bag of gold down the chimney. Marcus thanked his benefactor. Soon, people found out about Nicholas's gift. He became well known and loved. Even today, people still give secret gifts to children, and we say they are from Saint Nicholas. The shepherd and the wild sheep. Once there was a shepherd. Every night he counted and gathered his sheep. He was sure never to overlook any of them. One night, he saw some wild sheep had joined his herd. He hoped to acquire the newcomers. It snowed that night. In the morning, the shepherd couldn't take his sheep out of his lodge. Instead, he had to feed them inside. He gave a small amount of wheat to his own sheep, but he gave more of the food to the wild sheep. He thought the extra wheat would discourage them from leaving. It snowed for several days. During that time. The shepherd's sheep ate very little. The wild sheep, however, ate very well. At last, the snow melted, and they ventured outdoors. As soon as he opened the door of his hut, the wild sheep started to run away. Wait! This is how you repay me? After I treated you so kindly, why do you run away? The shepherd asked. His voice was full of hatred. The wild sheep stopped and turned toward the shepherd. We're leaving because you fed us better than your own sheep. One of the wild sheep replied, "You tried to deceive us with your ridiculous plan. Yesterday you treated us kindly, but tomorrow you might be different. If more wild sheep joined your herd, you would treat us as inferior sheep." As the wild sheep ran away, the shepherd understood his offense. He knew this awkward situation was his own fault. He had not been a satisfactory caretaker. He was a fake friend to the wild sheep. Because of this, he had neglected his own herd. The boy and his sled. Mike was the smallest child in school. Another boy, Joe, always teased Mike. Joe had a large scar on his face from fighting other children. One day, Joe offended Mike when he made fun of Mike's Valentine, Jane. Mike felt disgrace, but he didn't know how to make Joe stop. That day, Mike walked home down an alley. He found a bunch of wood boards next to a pine tree. He thought to himself. I could build a decent sled from this. If I let Joe use it, he will be nicer to me and Jane. He took the wood home. Mike got an axe and cut the wood. He used nails to make sure that the pieces were not loose. As he worked, he bumped his elbow on the boards. The painful sensation made him want to cry. It was a hard chore, but he persisted. He worked overnight. By morning, the sled was finished. Mike called Joe on the telephone. He said, "Hi, Joe." Come over to my house right away. Joe didn't know why Mike wanted him to come over. When Joe arrived, Mike told him, "Joe, it irritated me the other day when you said mean things about my card to Jane. You weren't kidding when you said those mean things. But I'm not like you. I just built this sled, and I'll let you ride it with me if you are nice." They became friends, and Joe was grateful that Mike was so nice to him. He learned that it is more fun to be nice than to be mean. Tiny Tina. In a distant land, there was a kingdom where fairies lived. Tina was a fairy. 
She had yellow curls and wore a dress made of wool. She always moved with grace. However, because of her compact size, she was scared of mankind. One day, there was an eclipse of the sun. The fairies didn't know what was happening. They were scared, so they ran away. Tina looked for a place to hide. She found a garden with flowers blooming. Tina had a passion for flowers. She decided to hide there. She became sleepy and made a pillow with some leaves. She whistled happily as she worked, and she fell asleep. Suddenly, somebody sneezed. The sound woke Tina up. She saw a very big face looking at her. Tina was so scared that she couldn't move. She could feel her pulse going very fast. The big woman went into her house. When she came back, she gave Tina a cup. The woman sat on the ground among some decaying leaves. Tina dipped a finger in the cup and tasted it. It was tea with all kinds of delicious spices in it. Tina felt refreshed after drinking the tea. I'm Wilma, the lady said. I spend all my leisure time in my garden cutting flowers. Would you like some dessert? Tina said yes. She was hungry, and she wasn't frightened anymore. She took a bite of cake and relaxed. How did you get to my garden? Tina told Wilma how she got lost. That's terrible. Let us take you home. Actually, I think that I want to stay with you, Tina said. She wasn't scared of big people anymore. Wilma and Tina lived happily ever after. Trick or Treat Many different cultures have had traditions about the dead. People in places like Ireland, China, Egypt, and Mexico believed that souls needed food. They thought the food nourished them on their journey from cemeteries to heaven. People had to put out good things for souls to eat. However, if the food rotted or spoiled, the soul got mad. The wicked soul might curse the family and make them starve during the winter. In other places, people begged for food on a holiday that remembers the souls of dead saints. People wore disguises with hoods that covered their faces. If they did not get food, they played a trick on the home. For this reason, the activity is known as trick or treating. Shortly after people first began trick or treating, parents started sending their children to beg on that day. Housewives gave the children food if they performed a song or a dance. When people moved to America from all over the world, they brought this tradition with them. Inhabitants of villages started trick or treating in the early 1900s. In 1939, a children's publication acquainted the whole country with the tradition. It became very popular. Today, trick or treaters are not begging for food and they are not scared of souls. They just enjoy the thrill of dressing up like creatures and getting candy. Ghosts and skeletons are favorite costumes. But some children wear fancy disguises, like pirates. They carry flashlights instead of fires. In some places, children still perform songs or riddles to get candy. But most of the time, they just say, Trick or treat! The Senator and the Worm A rich senator lived in a big house. He had more money than anyone in his district. One day, he was sitting on a chair listening to a radio broadcast. As he listened to the news bulletin, a worm crawled from underneath the chair and onto his head. His cook was in the kitchen stirring some spaghetti sauce. Suddenly, a cry from the senator alerted him. He ran to the rear of the house where the senator was sitting. The cook looked and saw the worm. He tried to console the senator. I'll take it off right away, he said. No, shouted the senator. I want you to kill it. But it's only a worm, the cook said. Why should we execute it? It hasn't committed a crime. The senator could not endure the worm on his head. Hurry, he shouted. The cook looked through several drawers but found nothing. Then he ran to the closet and took out a pipe. He returned to the senator and lifted the pipe over his head. He knew he couldn't just tap the worm. He was going to hit it hard. He grasped the pipe tightly. What are you waiting for, said the senator. Kill it. The cook swung the pipe at the senator's head. Oh no, the worm said. He's going to chop me in half. It jumped off the senator's head. There was a tremendous noise. Ow! cried the senator. A bump rose upon his skull. Meanwhile, the worm crawled outside. That was close, said the worm. Instead of being nice, he wanted to hurt me. Now that man has a big bump on his head. Patsy Ann 
A long time ago in Alaska, a dog named Patsy Ann watched the horizon. Every day she waited by the bay for ships returning from an expedition. Patsy Ann was a brilliant dog and she was very unique. She was deaf. She couldn't bark either. But she used all of her other senses to know when a ship was near. Patsy Ann lived on the streets. Her owners did not want her because she could not hear, so they abandoned her. She found refuge in a fancy hotel. Guests rubbed her back and scratched her chin. Many people gave her food. She became quite overweight. She became very famous. Visitors to Alaska were enthusiastic about meeting her. They brought presents for her. They liked seeing her, and the feeling was mutual. The mayor said Patsy Ann should be called the town's greeter. The people in town loved Patsy Ann too, even though she lived on the streets. They were willing to fight to keep her. A new law made all dogs wear a collar and get shots. The mayor received many complaints. People wanted Patsy Ann to be able to stay. One ambitious sailor got people to help. Together, they paid for Patsy Ann to go to the veterinarian. She got her shots and collar. She could stay. When Patsy Ann died, everyone missed the town's loyal greeter. So, the mayor hired someone to make a statue of Patsy Ann. He restored the town's greeter. Now, she sits at the dock forever, waiting for ships to come home. The Anniversary Gift Joe was a carpenter. He built houses in the highlands. Joe's wife Stella used a needle and thread to sew elegant clothing. She only used beautiful fabric to make clothes. Since they didn't have a lot of money, they lived in an old shed. Water dripped in when it rained. They had broken chairs instead of a couch. But they had coal for heat and flour from the mill for bread. Together, they trimmed the bushes to make their house look nice. Joe and Stella were poor, but not ashamed. They were happy. Sometimes in the evening, they walked downtown. They looked in store windows and dreamed. Stella wanted a hairbrush with an ivory handle. She pulled her hair upwards every day because she didn't have a brush to make it nice. Joe wanted to fix his grandfather's watch. For their anniversary, Stella wanted to get Joe what he wanted. But then she did the arithmetic. It would take at least six months to save enough money. Then she had an idea. She cut off all of her hair and sold it. Meanwhile, Joe knew that he could never fix his watch, so he polished it and sold it. He made enough to buy the brush. On their anniversary, the door burst open. Joe was excited to give Stella his gift. But first, Stella gave him the money to fix the watch. When he saw his wife without any hair, he smiled. I sold my watch to buy you something, Joe said. He gave her the brush, and she laughed. They were both willing to give up something very special to make each other happy. Dalton versus the Bully Dalton was a nice boy, but sometimes the other boys made fun of him because he was so tall and skinny. Dalton's biggest problem was Mitch. He was a bully who boasted about his strength. He quarreled with the other boys. Sometimes, if boys gave Mitch their lunch money, he would have mercy and leave them alone. One day, the boys learned about a special middle school Olympics. Their gym class was going to be in it. Many kids were excited, but Dalton thought it sounded like torture. That morning, Dalton ate plenty of carbohydrates for breakfast. He entered the gym and looked at the dial on the clock. It was time to begin. The teacher asked if they were ready. Everyone nodded, except Dalton. I got stung by a bee. I need to see the nurse, said Dalton. He made it up so he wouldn't have to play. I don't believe you. Get ready to play, responded the coach. First, they wrestled. Then they jumped, crawled, and played other games. But Mitch was dominant in every event. They strained all morning to defeat him. By lunch, they were sore. Their entire bodies ailed them. They thought about how to win. They knew the last game of the day was volleyball. Kids who used to be Dalton's rivals became his allies. They wanted him to help them beat Mitch. Dalton was going to be Mitch's opponent. The game started. Every time Mitch tried to hit the ball over the net, Dalton stopped it. Finally, Mitch used all of his strength, but the ball bounced off Dalton's hands and back into Mitch's face. 
Finally, Mitch was defeated. Anna the Babysitter Since her parents got a divorce, Anna has had to help her mother. In her mother's absence, Anna takes care of Grace, the baby. At first, Anna thought it was an easy job. One afternoon, Anna played with Grace. She meowed like a cat, and Grace imitated her. In fact, Grace reproduced every sound that Anna made. She took her sister outside. She put Grace in the wagon, but there was nowhere for them to go, so they went back inside. Anna put the infant on the floor and went into her room. But when she came back, Grace had vanished. Anna looked everywhere, but she could not find her sister. Maybe the baby had been kidnapped. Where are you? Anna called aloud. The situation was becoming urgent. She wanted to call her mom, but she didn't want her to think Anna couldn't do the job. Anna sat down. What was she going to do? But then, Anna heard something. It was coming from her room. Grace? She got down on her knees and looked under the bed. She could see Grace's bald head. Grace had followed Anna into her room and crept under the bed. What a relief, Anna cried. She picked up her sister and patted her on the head. Her head was soft and had no wrinkles. Grace was sucking on a thumb and looked tired. So Anna wrapped her in a blanket and sang rhymes for her. Then she put Grace in bed for a nap. After that afternoon, Anna knew that taking care of Grace was not an easy job. It takes a lot of work to take care of a baby. Peter and the Dwarf Peter was a hunter. One day he was in pursuit of a deer and became lost. He usually carried a compass with him when he went into the wilderness, but that day he left it at home. As he walked, the forest began to look different. He didn't see any bamboo. Instead, there were bushes with long leaves. The ecosystem was now very abnormal. Peter knew he was in the magic marsh. Now he was tired and thirsty. He was afraid. Being lost in the marsh could be fatal. When people entered it, they never came out. At last he found a pond. Flowers grew around it. The blossoms smelled like the best perfume. He felt relaxed, so he drank some water and fell asleep. When he awoke, he saw an evil dwarf staring at him. What are you doing here? it asked. The dwarf spoke in a strange dialect. I'm lost, said Peter. Can you help me? Yes, it said, but Peter didn't know it was dishonest. The dwarf took an old manuscript from his pocket. It was a magic map. Just recite the words at the bottom, the dwarf explained. It will show you how to get home. Good, Peter said. He was impatient and quickly grabbed the map. He recited the magic words, and a line appeared on the map. He walked for many days, but never left the marsh. Finally, the map led him back to the pond. He walked in a circle. The dwarf was still there. Here's a proverb for you to think about, it said. When patience is lost, then so are you. The Ice Cream Cone Explosion One day, John walked to his uncle's ice cream shop. When he reached the sidewalk, he caught the scent of ice cream cones and anticipated eating some ice cream. Sam opened the door. Uncle John had a new steel machine. What is that? It's a cone maker. I built it from a kit. You take flour from the barrel and put it in this pan, Uncle John said. Then add water and sugar here and stir it so the sugar dissolves. Next, you fasten down the beam. Uncle John wanted to look casual, but he was excited. He made a few swift motions and turned it on. There was a puff of smoke, and then cones came out the other end. Is it hard to use? Sam asked. On the contrary, it's easy to use. Want to try? Sam washed his hands with caution. He made a deliberate attempt to keep germs out of the dough. Soon, Sam had his first cone. He smiled in triumph. Uncle John tried to turn the machine off, but it just kept making cones. Sam and Uncle John put them on the counter, then on chairs. Before long, cones scattered all over the floor. They tried everything to stop it, but it wouldn't stop. What are we going to do? he said. Kick it, yelled Sam. Uncle John lifted his foot and gave the machine a kick. 
It made a funny noise and exploded. They were both covered with dough. Uncle John laughed when he knew Sam was okay. He tossed Sam a rag to clean his face and smiled. I guess we have enough cones now. Sheriff Dan Dan was the evil sheriff of Ocean Town. Dan was as cruel as the devil. He worshipped money. Dan was a millionaire, but he paid his police officers almost nothing. The police were very bitter, but Dan didn't care. He only cared about his money. Every person who inhabited Ocean Town disliked him. Dan enforced cruel laws. Once, Dan even put his own brother in jail for throwing a coin into a fountain. Sometimes, he pointed his gun into the air and pulled the trigger. He didn't want the bullets to hit anyone, he just wanted to scare people with the loud sound. Finally, the people of Ocean Town decided that they had to get rid of Sheriff Dan. With their understanding, the crowd sought to unify the town. They marched to Dan's house. He was startled by the sight when he ran to the door. When he opened the door, the crowd jumped on him. They used a rope to tie him to a chair. Dan yelled, Get your hands off of me! I'll put you all in jail for the rest of your lives! The crowd didn't listen. They carried Dan to the harbor and put him aboard a vessel. Dan was so scared that he began to sweat. He begged, If you let me go, I will give you all my money. The crowd said back, Sheriff, we don't care about your money. We know you will never change. We're sending you on a voyage to the middle of the ocean. The boat drifted out of the port, and Dan was never seen again. The people voted for a new sheriff who was kind and fair. The Helpful Apprentice There was once a small restaurant. People said that the best chef in the world worked there. But the chef was a horrible person to work for. He was impolite and scolded his workers all the time. The chef had a young apprentice. The apprentice's first priority was to make the best food in the world. He was happy to have a good teacher, but he didn't like the chef. The boy was a diligent worker. But the chef scolded him more than anyone else. Then one day, the chef got great news. The emperor wanted to have dinner there that night. He was very excited. He was working very fast, and he made a mistake. He cut his hand with a knife, and it started to bleed. The apprentice gave him a bandage, but the chef still couldn't cook. The chef started to panic. The apprentice tried to assure him, Everything will be okay, he said. But the chef was still afraid. Then they started to work together. They began to bond. The chef told the apprentice what to do. The boy cooked a great meal. As soon as they finished, the emperor arrived. He wore a beautiful robe made of soft fibers. He also had a massive crown. Everyone in the restaurant kneeled when the emperor came in. The chef and the boy brought out his food. The emperor was used to luxuries. Would he like the food? The emperor loved the food. After his departure, the chef was very proud and very thankful to his new friend, the apprentice. Why Monkey Has No Home For five years there was a famine. The farmers asked people to bless them and finally they had a good harvest. Since there was now plenty of food, the pharaoh decided to have a party. The party was a happy affair. For five days they had a huge feast. Monkey was very happy. Because of the famine he was very slim. He wanted to eat a lot of food. When he arrived at the feast, hundreds of long tables were filled with food. There were nuts, bowls of cereal, and ripe fruit. He could also smell hot roasted meat cooking on the stove. The assembly of animals was merry. However, during the feast, Monkey thought of a scheme to exploit the pharaoh's kindness. He decided to steal some of the food and then eat it at home. All the animals were cheerful. They didn't notice that Monkey was hiding food. After the feast, Monkey took the food to his house and ate it. He repeated this routine every day for four days. But on the fifth day, the pharaoh had a surprise. He was going to give all the animals a home. Monkey was very excited. But when he arrived at the pharaoh's home, 
he could not get through the door. The diameter of his waist was wider than the doorway. He was too fat. Monkey asked the pharaoh to forgive him for his theft, but the pharaoh said no. Pardon? asked the monkey. He didn't understand why the pharaoh was being unkind. Everybody else will have a home now, but not you. Now you know that greed gets you nothing, explained the pharaoh. Matthew learns a lesson. Matthew was a sensible boy. He always kept his room tidy and had a natural literary aptitude. One day, he hoped to have a career in journalism. The adolescent spent much of his time reading and liked having privacy, but his quiet personality hindered his ability to make friends. One day, Matthew went to the pharmacy to pick up some pills for his grandmother. He saw some boys leaning against a pole outside. One of the boys complimented Matthew. I like your jacket. Another boy asked, Do you want to go to Nate's restaurant? Sure, Matthew said. The boys walked to the restaurant. They were going to have slices of pizza. They ordered their food and drank soda with straws. They ate until their bellies swelled up. Matthew was having so much fun. One of the boys said, Let's leave without paying. Matthew didn't want to, but he presumed his new friends wouldn't like him if he didn't. Suddenly, the waiter yelled, Stop! The two other boys ran, leaving Matthew there alone. Soon, the police arrived. Leaving without paying for your meal is the same as stealing, said the police officer. The restaurant wants justice. So next week, you have to go to court and let a jury decide your punishment. When he went to court, the judge asked, Do you have anything to say, Matthew? He said, I feel sorrow for what I've done. Now I know that real friends won't ask you to do something illegal. The jury then let him have his liberty, but they made Matthew pick up trash as punishment. Much to Matthew's surprise, he ended up meeting some new friends. The Magic Cup Paul and John were brothers. They fought all the time because they both wanted to be leaders of the agency they both worked at. There was a superstition in their town about a magic cup. People said the cup was in a volcano located far away. Anyone who retrieved the cup would have their wish come true. John and Paul both wanted to find it. Then they could become the leader. They both left to find the cup. Before their trip, their mother said they should work together. They dismissed that idea. Even though their trips originated from the same house, each wanted to travel alone. They were both miserable during the trip. They had to navigate small boats across shallow rivers and climb difficult slopes. Their journey spanned many days. When they finally got close to the volcano, the ground began to vibrate and the volcano erupted. Ash filled the sky and lava covered everything. John climbed to the top of a hill to keep from getting burned. A few moments later, his brother went up the same hill. They were confined to the hill until the lava cooled down. They talked about the things they had seen while wandering around the country. They felt more sympathy and affection for each other than ever before. They decided that fate had brought them together. The next day they left to finish the remainder of the trip together. Everything seemed much easier. When they finally found the cup, they learned that it didn't make wishes come true. It was only an ordinary cup. But the trip to reach the cup taught them to work together and love each other. The Knight's Plan A town was fighting for their independence from another country. Several rebels started a revolution. However, they were afraid of an invasion from a lot of troops. They didn't have enough warriors to stop them, so they asked a knight for help. The knight made a plan. A tall mountain was outside the town. The road near the top was very narrow. Cliffs rose on both sides of it. We must trick the enemy. They have to follow us up the mountain, the knight explained. On the narrow path, only a few can attack us at one time. The people agreed with the knight's plan. The knight put on his armor, and the warriors got their spears. When the enemy attacked, the knight and warriors acted as if they were afraid. They quickly withdrew toward the mountain. The enemy troops followed them up the steep path. 
Soon, the enemy became tired. At the summit, the knight and his troops stopped. The enemy was close behind them, but now they were tired. Also, only a few could attack because the path was narrow. The knight and the warriors fought the enemy, but there were too many troops. The knight was afraid. If the warriors yielded the path to the enemy, the town would be lost. A storm suddenly came over the mountain. There was strong wind and rain. Thunder boomed. Lightning struck some trees near the enemy. The trees blazed. The flames scared the enemy, and they retreated. They ran down the mountain, out of the town, and never returned. The knight explained, With a little luck, a good plan beats even a big army. The Magic Pear Tree It was a cool morning, and the grass was covered in mist. The market was full of people. A mean farmer named Jack yelled, Pears for sale! He sat on a bench, plotting how he could trick people. Then an orphan came to his cart. Can you spare a pear? she asked. Jack felt rage. He replied, You don't have any money. Please, I haven't had supper in days. No, shouted the farmer. The orphan sighed. However, a pregnant lady heard the dispute and confronted Jack. Just give her a pear, she said. Jack had no shame and said no. Finally, a man bought a pear for the girl. The girl quickly ate it, but she saved the seed. She wanted to get revenge. She told Jack, I know a way to get hundreds of pears in one day. I'll show you how. He watched the girl dig a hole. She dropped the seed into the ground. Then she spread the dirt over it. Watch closely, she said. In a few minutes, a stem will grow. It'll turn into a tree that's full of pears. Jack stared at the dirt, but nothing happened. The only objects there were a few daisies. He looked for the girl, but she had snuck away. Then he looked at his cart in horror. It was empty. He suddenly realized that the orphan had tricked him. While Jack was waiting for the tree to grow, the people had taken the pears from his cart. They all laughed while they were eating the tender fruit. The farmer felt ashamed. The incident taught him to be kinder. Little Wolf and Mother Wolf Mother Wolf was a magnificent animal. She had all the traits of a terrific hunter. She was very strong and fast. She knew how to hide and how to seize prey. Mother Wolf was the forest's supreme creature. Her skills were evident to all the other animals. Mother Wolf lived in a den beneath a tree with her cub, Little Wolf. At dawn, Little Wolf and Mother Wolf were eating breakfast. Little Wolf looked sad. Mother Wolf said, What is wrong, my cub? Little Wolf said, I want to be big like you. You can run and leap better than anyone. You can howl so loudly. Being big is a necessity, and I am so small. Mother Wolf said, Don't be dissatisfied with your size. Being small can be very helpful sometimes. Just then, rain and hail began to fall. The tree was hit by lightning. It fell on the wolf's den. Little Wolf was scared. The wolves knew that escaping the den was vital. Mother Wolf said, Little Wolf, I cannot move the heavy pile of branches, but you can escape with ease. You can get out and find help. Little Wolf crawled out of the den and called all the large animals for help. They went to the den and pulled away the branches. Mother Wolf came out and said, Thank you, Little Wolf. You saved my life. She softly squeezed Little Wolf and kissed her. Little Wolf smiled. She said, Mother, this outcome has taught me a profound lesson. Even though I'm small, I'm still important. The Old Man with a Bump An old man had a large bump on his face. He went to the best physician in town. He gave the old man tragic news. I can't do anything. You'll have to get accustomed to it. One day the old man went into the forest. Suddenly the light became dim. It was going to rain. So he found a hollow tree to sit under. It leaked a little, but there was no other place he could wait. 
When the rain stopped, his joints felt stiff from sitting. Suddenly, he heard a tune coming from far away. Many fables said monsters lived in the forest. No one could affirm that the stories were true, though. Still, his instincts told him that there was something out there. He walked farther into the forest. Then he saw a fire glowing. He was astonished to see a clan of monsters. They were having a great feast and banging on drums. He stood behind a tree, spying on them. Then the leader asked, Who's the best dancer here? Me, the man yelled, coming from behind the tree. He started to dance. When he was finished, the leader said, I want you to dance every night. In order to make sure you return, I'm going to keep something you love. Please don't take my bump, he begged. I can't sacrifice it. It's good luck, he exclaimed, pointing at it for emphasis. The monsters agreed that they had to take his bump. After they did, the man stroked his face to make sure it was gone. He had tricked them. He never went back, and he never had to worry about his bump again. The Circus Ben was unhappy. He lived on a ranch near a small town, and he didn't have many friends. Then one day, a messenger came to the ranch. He showed the headline in the town newspaper. The circus was coming to the town. It even coincided with Ben's birthday. Ben was very excited as his father steered the car through the town. The circus couldn't accommodate all the people who wanted to see the show, but Ben had a ticket. Ben peered at the activity around him. He watched people of both genders dance all around. They wore funny costumes, and their hair was dyed many different colors. Also, tame tigers with stripes on their fur did tricks. Outside, people could commission an informal portrait. They posed in front of a funny picture while an artist quickly drew them. Ben couldn't believe it. He was happier than he had ever been before. That day, Ben knew what he wanted to do. He loved the circus to such an extent that he wanted to have his own circus when he grew older. Seeing the circus was like a dose of medicine for him. He wasn't unhappy anymore. He felt special. He inquired about what he needed to do to have his own circus. He studied hard and learned about business. Ben worked very hard, and one day he had his own circus. It was a great circus. People told him that he could be very rich, but he wasn't tempted by money. He just wanted to make children happy. He knew the circus had changed his life, and he wanted to do the same thing for others. Lazy Hans Hans was lazy. He seldom helped his mother with anything. He didn't cook and he never mowed the lawn. He didn't even shave. He spent the daytime gambling with his mother's money. One day his mother realized that her money was gone from her purse. You're banned from my house, she shouted. Don't come back until you've learned your lesson. Hans went to live in the forest like an outlaw. But it was cold and Hans couldn't find food. He went to a cottage to ask for a meal. An aborigine answered the door. Can I stay here, please? Hans asked. You can stay if you work the man replied. Hans liked the prospect of food and warmth, so he agreed. The man pointed to a field. Take this rod and plant it over there. I am a wizard, and this magic rod will bring us food. The field was far away. Hans knew it would be hard to walk there, so he just threw the rod behind the cottage and sat by the river. When daylight faded, he returned to the cottage and went to sleep. The next morning, the old man looked very fierce. You didn't take the rod to the field, he shouted. No, confessed Hans, it was too far. Because of you, we have nothing to eat, replied the man. Hans was terrified that the man would punish him, so he ran home. Mama, he cried, I'm desperate to come back. His mother was cautious. Do you promise to work, she asked. Yes, said Hans. I'll never be lazy again. The Bremen Town Musicians Larry the Cow, Harry the Rooster, and Lester the Duck lived on a widow's farm. 
They dreamed of playing music in a parade. One day, the widow went to the lawn where her herd of cattle was grazing. I'll eat him tomorrow, she said, pointing to Larry. Larry wanted to flee, but he didn't have the nerve to go by himself. Then his friends Lester and Harry showed him a poster. It's for a parade in Bremen. We'll go with you, and we can perform our symphony there, Lester said. The animals put together a small bundle that held a drum, a flute, and a portable microphone. Then they took their baggage and initiated their long journey. They walked down a paved lane all day. That night, they looked in the window of a house. They saw a group of thieves. They were eating a large dinner and telling stories about their greed and the people they stole from. Lester was an optimist. He said, I think we can scare them away. Soon, the animals came up with a plan. Harry flew inside and knocked over the lamp. What was that? screamed a thief as the bulb broke. They could barely see now. Then Larry stood on two feet, and Lester flew to the top of his head. They looked very big. All three of the animals made scary noises. The thieves tried to hit the animals, but Harry flew over them and scratched them. It's a phantom! yelled one thief. The thieves ran away. The animals ate and rested. The next morning, Larry said, Why go to Bremen? We can stay here and make music. And so they remained there and were quite happy. How did Greenland get its name? The nation of Greenland isn't very green. The sun's rays don't shine there for three whole months. As a result, it's covered with snow, ice, and frost. Then how was the name derived? It started with a Viking named Eric the Red. Eric had many merits. However, there was an underlying problem. He got angry easily. People were scared of him. However, he was married to the niece of a very powerful man, so everybody tried to be nice to him. One day, Eric fought with his neighbor and killed him. His consequent punishment was to leave Iceland. Many stories circulated about a land west of Iceland, but only a fraction of the people in Iceland believed them. Still, Eric wanted to find it. Eric sailed toward the land via the Atlantic Ocean. His marine knowledge was good, but the trip was hard. Some of his men drowned. Eric's lieutenant wanted to resign from his position. Others thought about committing suicide. Suddenly, Eric thought he saw something. I don't believe it, said Eric. It must be an illusion. But it was no trick. It was the new land. Eric trembled in the cold polar air. He saw that there was ice everywhere. He realized that the ice could keep enemies out. Not even the best navy could invade the new land. He could start a new dynasty in his name. But how could he convince people to live here? I'll call it Greenland, he said. Eric's plan worked. Within two years, over a thousand people moved to Greenland. In the end, Greenland got its name all because of a trick. Everyone is special. When I was young, everything that went wrong in my house seemed to be my fault. Once, my brothers tried to make cookies. They blended flour and ginger and made a disgusting paste. Then they tried to wash it down the drain, but it got all over the floor. Later, my brothers said that I did it, and I had to wipe it up. I worried that my parents liked them more than me. One autumn day, I was sure I would make my parents proud. I bought a model rocket. After I put it together, I invited everybody to watch it. I wanted my brothers to envy my technical knowledge. I lit the fuse, but nothing happened. Looks like your fireworks don't work. I hope you kept the receipt so you can return them, my brother said. It's not fireworks, I screamed. They were making fun of me again. I didn't know what went wrong. I hadn't altered anything. I quickly moved the wires on the bottom, hoping that would help. Suddenly, the rocket flew up. We stood aside as it curved through the lawn and ran straight into the mailbox. Then the mailbox collapsed, 
The rocket was crushed. Embarrassed, I ran inside and hid. A few minutes later, my mom asked, Are you okay? I just wanted them to be jealous of me for once. Now I see why you and Dad don't love me as much as them, I said. That's not true, said my mom. See my fingers? Each one is different. You kids are like my fingers. All are different, but I love them all the same. I embraced her. Now I know that my parents love me just as much as my brothers. Pizarro and the Inca Gold According to rumors, there's lots of precious gold hidden in the jungles of Peru. It got there when the Spanish conquered parts of South America. The Spanish noble, Francisco Pizarro, arrived in Peru in the 1500s. He found a group of people called the Incas. The Incas believed that their leader, Atahualpa, was both a king and a god. But Pizarro didn't agree. It is a sin for a man to think he is God, he said to Atahualpa. Atahualpa thought Pizarro was insulting his heritage. He thought the blonde Spanish men held prejudices against the Incas. But Atahualpa was a kind man and didn't want to fight the Spaniards. He said, If I give you a room full of gold, will you leave my country in peace? Pizarro was suspicious. He thought Atahualpa was exaggerating. But a few days later, Pizarro returned to the Inca palace with his ambassadors. He saw a room filled with stacks of gold. There were golden necklaces, cups, plates, and vases. It was a great spectacle. He acknowledged that Atahualpa had told the truth. But after seeing the gold, he wanted all of Peru's gold, so he didn't leave the country. The Spanish soldiers stayed in Peru and grabbed all the gold they could find. But the Inca people tricked the Spaniards. They mixed the gold with tin so that it was poor quality. They gave this gold to the Spaniards. Meanwhile, they hid the good gold. They stuffed it into sacks and dragged it deep into the jungle. The Spanish conquerors never found the gold. People think it is still there today. The Boy Who Saved the Town Marcus lived in a small suburb near the sea. He was a stubborn boy, and he only cared about himself. His father worked as a chemist for an institution and wanted Marcus to get a job there. Instead, the boy delivered milk. Each morning he took dairy products to the grocers. One day, Marcus was jogging down the street with a gallon of milk to give to a merchant. He didn't want to be late. He ran down a path beside a large canal. A wall there kept water from coming into the town during high tide. But Marcus saw a small hole in the wall. Marcus knew that if the wall broke, it would be a tragedy for the town. At first, he hesitated. He had to choose between helping himself and helping the town. There was only one way to save the town. It seemed crazy to him, but it was the only thing he could do. He poked his finger into the hole. This didn't fix the problem forever, but it did postpone the tragedy. His finger ached. He felt the chill of the Arctic water as it splashed him. There was no one else around. He knew he had to wait until the tide descended. It was very difficult, but Marcus stayed there and saved the town. Once the tide had descended, Marcus told everyone what happened. A group of people went to the wall. They saw the hole and fixed it. Everyone was very happy with Marcus. The local congress even gave him a gift for saving the town. He was a hero. An Interesting Life A man looked through some boxes with his grandson. They were filled with old photographs and objects that portrayed important events from the grandfather's life. He wished to share the circumstances behind each event with his grandson. The grandson, however, thought his grandfather's stories were boring. The grandfather coped with this. He ignored his grandson's criticism. He took a photo from the box. That's the submarine I was on during the war, he explained. The grandson gazed at it. The grandfather glanced at the next picture and frowned. It showed a row of coffins. His grandson noticed the grief in his grandfather's face. What is it? the boy inquired. 
This was after a nuclear bomb was dropped, the grandfather answered. It devastated a city. Next, the grandfather pulled a toy microscope from the box and rotated it in his hand. Where did you get that? the grandson asked. This is a souvenir I bought at the science museum, the grandfather said. Now the boy was really interested. He started to understand that his grandfather was telling him a larger story. It was the story of his grandfather's life. He got another photo. It showed a young bride and groom. They were very happy. A certificate was attached to the photo. The boy couldn't read it, but he traced his finger over paper. What's this from, Grandad? he asked. That's my marriage license from the day I married your grandmother, the grandfather said. Wow, said the boy. Grandad, now I know all about your life. The Kitten and the Caterpillar Katie the kitten liked to play. One day, Cory the caterpillar emerged from a hole in the wall while Katie was playing in the living room. Hey! Katie yelled. Do you want to play with me? Cory was reluctant. He said, I'd rather not play with you. I have several handicaps. My body is very delicate. Your claws are as sharp as hooks. You might cut me. Plus, I have no bones, not even a spine. You could easily hurt me. I swear that I won't hurt you, Katie said. No, I don't want to, he said again. He hopped from the wall, but Katie pursued him. Cory ran into the kitchen and into the cupboard, but Katie chased closely behind. Katie knocked appliances to the floor. Plates fell into the sink and broke in the basin. Then he ran into a bedroom. Some laundry was on the floor. Cory hid under a shirt, but Katie saw him. She jumped on the shirt. Her paws left stains on the cloth, and her claws ripped the sleeves into strips. However, Cory escaped. He utilized a small crack in the floor to hide, but Katie saw him. Now you are trapped, said Katie. Cory tried to avoid Katie's claws. He moved his body as far into the hole as possible. He didn't know how he'd get out of the hole. Just then, Katie's owner came home. She saw that the house was a mess. She took a broom and swung it at Katie. She chased Katie out of the house. Cory was safe, and Katie was left outside because she didn't listen to the wishes of others. 